Hello class, this is a presentation on interpretivism. This presentation was put together by Josh Imes, Dilnoza Kasilova, and Nick Whips. Before we get into the big details of what interpretivism really is, we must first simply try to explain this philosophy. This is no easy task because this philosophy covers so much ground. Interpretivism emerged in direct contradistinction to positivism in an attempt to understand and explain human and social reality. This approach looks for culturally derived and historically situated interpretation of the social life world. In an effort to put this a little more simply, Interpretive studies assume that people create and associate their own subjective meanings as they interact with the world around them. So, in essence, an interpretive researcher attempts to understand phenomena through accessing the meanings participants assign to them. So, when an interpretive researcher enters the field uh, with some sort of prior insight of the research context, um, they assume that this is going to be insufficient in developing a fixed research design. So basically, the researcher remains open to new knowledge throughout the study and lets it develop with the help of the informants that he or she is studying. So this comes from the interpretivist belief that humans have the ability to adapt and that no one can gain prior knowledge of time and context bound social realities. So what the big question ends up being is that is there a real distinction between natural reality and social reality? Uh, if you read the chapters on interpretivism, you'll see that uh, some of the philosophers that have contributed to this approach have differences in their opinions on uh, this, this very question. Our interest in the social world tends to focus on exactly those aspects that are unique, individual, and qualitative, whereas our interest in the natural world focuses on more abstract phenomena, that is, those exhibiting quantifiable empirical regularities. So it's important for the interpretivist researcher uh, as a social actor to appreciate differences between people. Uh, interpretivism studies usually focus on meaning and may employ multiple methods in order to reflect different aspects of the issue. So with the general idea of what the interpretivist approach is and what a researcher with this mindset does, um, let's look at some of the founding fathers of interpretivism that I had mentioned earlier. So interpretivism is often linked to the thought of Max Weber, who suggested that in human sciences, we are concerned with verstehen. I hope I pronounced that right, but uh, it's another word uh, for understanding. Uh, this has been taken to mean that Weber is contrasting the interpretive approach needed in the human and social sciences with the explicative approach focused on causality that is found in natural sciences. So then you have Wilhelm Dilthe um, and his thoughts on this uh, difference between uh, natural reality and social rea reality uh, are that these two um, approaches in themselves are completely different kinds of reality. And because they're different kinds of reality, uh, their investigation requires different methods. Then you have philosophers Wilhelm Windelband and Heinrich Rickert who look at this distinction and reject the notion that 
there there is a real distinction between natural and social realities. Um, they accept that there is a logical distinction, uh, one conceived by the mind, between the two. So then where does Weber sit on this issue? Uh, on one hand, he agrees with Windowban and Rickert in rejecting Dilthey's real distinction between natural reality and social reality. And he believes or believed that there is only a logical distinction between them. On the other hand, though, um, Weber does not feel that this necessitates the use of different methods in researching these two realms. So as Weber sees it then, is that one scientific method should apply to these two forms of science and should cater for both. Now that we have a general idea of what this theory entails and the researchers that helped to develop this theory, uh, we also want to look at the interpretivist roots. Um, the interpretivist approach to human inquiry has been developed from three historical streams, hermeneutics, phenomenology, and symbolic interactionism. Let's start with symbolic interactionism. This perspective, quite simply, relies on the symbolic meaning that people develop and relies upon the process of social interaction. Symbolic interaction theory analyzes society by addressing the subjective meanings that people impose on others, uh, objects, events, and behaviors. Thus, society is thought to be socially constructed through human interpretation. People interpret one another's behavior, and it's these interpretations that form the social bond. Some fundamental aspects of our social experience and identities Let's take race and gender, for example, can be understood through the symbolic interactionist lens. Having no biological biases at all when we're born, uh, both race and gender are social constructs that we learn, and they function based on what we believe to be true about people, given what they look like. So let's take a a very shocking example of how this theoretical concept plays out within social the social construct of race. Um, and one of the things that's manifested in, in many minds is the fact that many people, regardless of race, believe that lighter skinned African Americans and Latinos are smarter than their darker skinned counterparts. This phenomenon occurs because of the racist stereotype, um, the meaning that has been encoded in skin color, the symbol um, that has just been manifested over centuries. Within symbolic interactionism, there's also differentiated streams, such as the pragmatist view, which was accepted by Dewey and James and was altogether far less critical and was many times liberal, tolerant, and optimistic. Ethnography undertaken from an interactionist perspective has been framed schematically in many ways. Uh, examples of this would include the dramaturgical approach, game theory, negotiated order theory, labeling theory, and grounded theory. Let's talk about phenomenology next. So within the realm of interpretivism, phenomenology suggests to lay aside our prevailing understandings of those phenomena and revisit our immediate experience of them. <clears throat> Possibilities for new meaning emerge for us or we witness at least an authentication and enhancement of former meaning. So in its basic form, phenomenology attempts to create conditions for the objective study of topics usually regarded as subjective. So this would be consciousness and the content of conscious experiences such as judgments, perceptions, and emotions. And while phenomenology seeks to be scientific, it does not attempt to study consciousness from the perspective of a clinical 
psychology or neurological perspective. Um, instead, it seeks through this systematic reflection <clears throat> to determine the essential properties and structures of experience. There are several assumptions behind phenomenology that help explain its foundations a little bit better. Uh, first, it rejects the concept of objective research, like I had already said. Um, phenomenologists prefer grouping assumptions through a process, process called phenomenological epoch. Uh, phenomenology believes that analyzing daily human behavior can provide one with a greater understanding of nature. Uh, persons should be explored. This is because persons can be understood through the unique ways they reflect the society they live in. Um, phenomenologists prefer to gather captive or conscious experience rather than traditional data. And finally, phenomenology is considered to be oriented on discovery. And therefore, phenomenologists gather research using methods that are far less restricting than in other sciences. So phenomenology is quite single-minded in identifying, understanding, describing, and maintaining the subjective experience of the respondents. It is subjectivist in its approach and usually uncritical. Uh, the great phenomenological principle is putting oneself in the place of the other. Last but not least, we have hermeneutics. Hermeneutics as a disciplined approach to interpretation can be traced back to the ancient Greeks and even then was meant to interpret, to understand, seeing, explaining, or translating. So ultimately, hermeneutics is the in-depth inquiry in the text in which the parts are related to the whole for revealing deeper meanings. Hermeneutics can be extremely broadly applied to many different um, aspects of life. Uh, etymology, religious traditions, uh, different uh, contexts like uh, sociology, law, political philosophy, and even psychology. Let's just give an example in one of these contexts to try and help explain hermeneutics just a little bit better. So let's let's talk about the Bible. So if we were to talk about her, hermeneutics in the biblical aspect, um, it would be the study and principles of interpretation of the Bible. And there are traditionally four different types of biblical hermeneutics, literal, moral, allegorical, and anagogical. Modern hermeneutics also has many founding fathers and theorists, such as Frederick Schleiermacher, Wilhelm Dilthe, Martin Heidegger, and Hans Gadmer, each of which have their own take on hermeneutics. I'm not going to go through all of their philosophies, but this is just another example of all of the different ways hermeneutics can be looked at and perceived. I talked about this a little bit before when talking about biblical hermeneutics, but hermeneutics is also invoked in many fields of inquiry when it comes to the act of reading. Um, you can include literary criticism and reading comprehension theory with several different approaches to reading certain texts such as the empathetic approach, the interactive approach, or the transactional mode of reading. Um, a great amount of hermeneutic theory is the prospect of gaining an understanding of the text that is deeper or goes further than the author's own understanding. Once again, we can go back to that uh, biblical hermeneutics example when, when talking about this. So within this structure, you are also bringing parts of an experience to create a whole, which eventually creates a hermeneutic circle. I'm not going to lie, interpretivism is a very broad and complex topic, and it was this chapter was a hard read. But if we're going to leave you with anything, is it is more about understanding human behavior than explaining it. When asked to try to explain his point of view, Max Weber stated, the time has now come for us to understand human dynamics and not simply measure it. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day.